So the way we usually start off these discussions is we invite uh, we invite our guests to reflect back on, mo as you can see, most of the students here are undergrads, some graduate students, but most are at the, sort of at that point where they're thinking about what to do with their careers. So what we try to do each evening is ask somebody, a, a distinguished leader like yourself, to come and talk, like, take, a, take them back a little bit in time to where you were when you were in college or coming into global health. And so I know we talked about this a little bit the other day with uh, the Regents, but if maybe you could paint a little picture for our friends, uh, our students here about where it, you know, where your career started when you started to think about global health and this work. Um, and what was the passion, what sort of drove you into this space? And, and, I, and I would just note that, you know, we've, Dr. Bazira is gonna have a somewhat different story than some of the other uh, uh, folks we've talked about because of your history growing up in Uganda before you came to the United States, which you'll explain, but um, it's just really powerful. And so if you could maybe just give us a sense, what I think what we've found over the years is that many students here are thinking about what they want to do with their own lives and how to think about what moves them and what keeps them passionate. If you could share a little bit, take you back in just a couple years, it's not that long ago, uh, to when you were in college, that would be great. Uh, thanks, John, and good evening, everyone. Uh, is that really what you want to hear about, or you've got your own questions? You know, we have questions too. What John wants to hear about? Well, I would. Li well, I'd like to hear about it. I I found that over the years, mostly what I'm interested in is what people are like to hear uh -huh. too. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not always the case. But I. But uh, we will have plenty of time for questions. So, but tell us, give us a little bit of an. Okay. Overview. Yeah. It's it's a long time. You know, it's, since I was last in college, uh, so I will try to I'll try to remember and recall. Uh, the decision-making processes. Um, all I know is that I had to pick between becoming an engineer, uh, a lawyer, a medical doctor, um, and then I ended up actually doing pharmacy instead. Uh, and the reason I picked pharmacy, to be honest, there wasn't any, any strategic thinking behind it. Um, it so happened to be the newest uh, program that was offered, it was cool. Uh, it also took the top students in the country. It had the highest uh, cut-off point requirements in my year when I was going to, to university. So, Where were you at this time? Uh, in I was Kampala? In, in Kampala, yes, uh, in a high school, in a Catholic high school uh, run by brothers, of, they call them brothers for or Christian, Christian, Christian brothers? brothers yeah, Christian okay. brothers, yeah. So, so, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to go do it and see what this really is about. Uh, so as I got into it, um, a few things excited me about it, and that was mostly uh, to do with um, pharmacokinetics, understanding how drugs work uh, within the human body. And so I thought maybe, you know what? I could finish and go into industry and make drugs. Because I also, during all that time, I used to visit hospitals, and I did clinical pharmacy. I spent a lot of time on the ward and I said this uh, last week, I never came across a single patient that was happy. So a part of me figured if I wanted to make money off this business or this profession, I can't do it by interacting with patients on a daily basis because I would be depressed. You know, when you're dealing with people who are not happy on a daily basis. So I thought I could then still be helpful by going into industry to make drugs. And that's, that's really what I wanted to do. Uh, when I was in college. And you got your pharmacy degree. Yes. But then you degree. decided maybe you wanted to do more. Then, uh, so when I was still in college, in addition to pharmacy, I, I was also a politician. So um, I was a president uh, of the Student Guild, uh, which this was uh, the student administration. At that time, I think, were about 4,000 students in the university. And I was the first non-artist guild president. So all the presidents used to be law students, economists, political scientists, uh, because the misconception at that time was that they had so much time on their hands and therefore they could afford to get into politics. So I, you know, I crossed over from the other side of campus and I decided to engage in campus politics and you know, got elected um, president. So in, in countries like Uganda, when you are a, a a university guild president at that time, you know, of the main public university in the country, Makerere University. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, 
um, you actually get a lot of exposure. So you have meetings with the president of the country, you have meetings with, uh, with ministers and politicians, because you're also leading students who are agitating for change in very many ways. Uh, so you're putting out student strikes, you're dealing with uh, faculty strikes. So you know, you're kind of uh, putting the national spotlight. So you start developing other ideas. So when I left university, uh, one of the first things that happened was I, you know, I sat for the board and became um, uh, a pharmacist registered and licensed to work in the country. And we had our own professional body called the pharmaceutical side of Uganda. So because of my political history, I got elected on my first year of, of being in that, um, in that society to lead the society, you know, with only one year experience. I really didn't know much about, um, about the society, but I, I guess folks figured that since I'd come from hardcore politics at the university, I could also help uh, pharmacists navigate the political issues, especially around uh, health sector reforms. Uh, at that point, uh, a lot of countries who are going through uh, the World Bank and IMF sponsored structural adjustment programs. You know, those of you who study economics and, and, and global business, you may have heard about that. Um, and these reforms in government were leading to a lot of uh, cuts in social spending, uh, so which means health workers wouldn't ask for salaries and, and get those salary raises when the World Bank and IMF is telling government you cut back on social spending because social sectors don't actually produce any wealth. They consume, that was the argument. So you need to put money into the economic productive sectors of the, of the economy in order to make money there, generate wealth, and then you can come back and you spend on things like health. So as you can imagine, um, all health professionals didn't like that. So we're always teaming up with the doctors, with the nurses, and you know, teachers, uh, lawyers rarely. It's, it's rare to find lawyers you know, agitating for salary raises because they mostly practice in the private sector anyway. Uh, so I, I guess that, that, also, that fight also helped me to get in front um, of politicians and policy makers. And, and you, you, if, if you know yourself, you quickly find out um, what you don't know when you're in, this, in these types of interactions. You're just a pharmacy graduate. All you know is about drugs. You come out and you find yourself um, in meetings with Ministry of Finance folks or Ministry of Health folks. So a lot of the things they're talking about, you really don't get it. You know, you're probably going to be arguing from the heart, and they're using a lot of facts. You know, most of them uh, economic facts that you don't you don't get, you don't understand. So I, at that point, I started debating whether I needed to continue on this trajectory of of pharmacy, go into industry, make drugs. Um, I sensed that unless I'm very successful there in the pharmaceutical industry, I could find myself back in a place where some other person has to make all the policies all the time, and I just live by those policies, whether I like them or I don't like them. So I was like, why can't I figure out a way of uh, learning how to influence policy or even make policy? Um, instead of being with, uh, we, we used to joke about it, instead of being the one who has to go, go hunt find the animal, I, do, I know a lot of you are vegans, so you're not gonna like this example, uh, but you go out hunting, and I, I'm using hunting because I come from, uh, from Uganda, it, you know, we have lots of animals there, we used to hunt even as I was growing up. So you go hunting, you kill your animal, you know, you skin it, sometimes you even cook it, and then when the time comes for serving, someone else says, you know what, I'm gonna take over the serving. You've done your job, thank you so much, let me take over from here. And that's what happens with resource allocation uh, in the government. The people who do the hard work are not the ones who necessarily allocate resources. So that, that kind of got me um, ticked up the wrong way. And I wanted to be with those who make decisions about resource allocation. Uh, and I don't have to live with the bad decision that others make. You know? uh, so the, at that point, I took a... Uh, be in the room where it happened. I wanted to be in the room where it happened, but then the question was, how could I quickly get to this? Um, 
So what path did you take? So you so decided that pharmacy may not be the only way to get may not be the only way. So I decided, you know what? I'm actually going to join the military. And the reason I picked the military was because um, our president then and now, uh, th you know, almost 30 years later, uh, you know, was a general. Uh, you know, he, he stood for elections at one time. He lost miserably. And then he claimed that the elections were rigged. And he decided to wage a war. He was successful. And he took over government. So, you know, was, I was like, this guy didn't like the outcome of the election. Now look at him. He's president of the country. So maybe going through the military is the fastest way of doing it. So I actually enrolled and I got enlisted and I joined the military, you know, but through the medical corps, which was a lot easier, and uh, did military training, uh, came back as a commissioned officer, um, you know, and I eventually got to the rank of a major. And then I became a chief pharmacist okay. of the military. But as a chief pharmacist at that point, um, now I was making decisions, you know. So I had a team of pharmacists that I was working with, but at least I was part of management. You were making these decisions at that point. Yes, and when you're, when you're within the defense sector, um, it doesn't matter which country you're in. It's one of the, you know, most well-resourced sector in, uh, in, in any government. Uh, because of this thing they call classified spending. So any, any time you want to do something that, you don't want the public to know about, you classify it as, you know, it's a classified spending. It's only the president who can lift the veil on that, you know, to tell people what that is. So you can- it Doesn't happen here. I've, I've, I've read some reports about that. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I ended up um, joining the military and then uh, after, I think, four years in the military, I asked to be allowed to leave uh, at that point, I sensed that I also had an entrepreneur side to me, uh, so I wanted to, uh, and I had also noticed there were some other shortcomings in my own competencies, so I decided to go to business school, you know, uh, try to get an MBA, learn something about management, because there is so much you can do, you know, using natural instincts, and at some point, you have to you have to learn the basics. You have to know the principles, you know. So I, I decided to go to business school. And I was only interested in learning one thing, and that was strategy. So, so I actually focused on strategic management. Started off at Makere University in Uganda and finished the MBA, really. And as I was done, uh, just as I was about to defend my thesis, I, I got a fellowship to go to the Netherlands, to the Maastricht School of Management. Um, to, to do an MBA. So at that point, I was like, I've already spent two years doing an MBA. Why should I go to do another MBA? So what I decided to do was a post-MBA uh, executive training. And I focused exclusively on strategy and industrial cycle project management. Um, since the country, you know, when you come from a developing country, uh, you're always aspiring to get into production. You, you know, you've got big construction projects going on. Uh, so also you want folks that can actually uh, design projects and see them through. Uh, so, so I did that. Then I went back to Uganda after that. Um, I had promised I would go to the military, but you know, through family, friends, and connections, I was allowed not to go back into the military. And so I, I went into the Minister of Health now and uh, joined the regulatory side uh, of the ministry. Um, looking at pharmaceutical regulatory issues. Um, so you, at that point, you are interacting a lot with pharmaceutical manufacturers again. Uh, you are looking at market access issues. But then I also found the reforms were still going on. They never ended. <laughs> so now this was like the third wave uh, of reforms. And Uganda, that was around 1999, needed to come up with the first ever health policy and a strategic plan for the health sector. Uh, so I got. Um, tapped to join a small group within the ministry or within government that also included the private sector uh, to help draft that and develop that and then go around the country and train our developed systems, which were, we call districts, to also come up with their own strategic um, health plans uh, so that we can have um, kind of like a, a goal-directed approach uh, to how we approached health issues in the country. So I did that. Um, it took us about a year 
obviously, with the World Bank at the table. You can never do anything in these countries without the World Bank at the table, because at the end of the day, they have to keep saying, whatever you plan to do, think about resource availability. You know, we've got limited resources. Resources are constrained. That's what the economists say. So you always, they have to keep watch. The bank moved at all from its initial position because it, in, in the, during that time they were beginning to shift their focus on how they thought about health and social spending. But it's still a long way from where uh, they yeah, are. Yeah, so now what they were doing, they're also trying to at least put their resources where their interests lay. So, so the World Bank was interested in things like strengthening primary care systems. They were interested in investing in some maternal child health programs. Because the argument goes, um, you know, if you get the young people to survive and live longer, they're going to, you know, they're going to have a, a longer life. They'll get into economic production uh, sectors of the economy. They can contribute to the wealth of the country, as opposed to maybe providing treatment for the elderly, you know, who might be soon retiring. Because they always look at this whole thing of dependency ratio, uh, <laughs> you know. So, so they stopped shouting a lot about making structured adjustment changes, but they were putting their resources where they wanted to be. Uh, and also that was at the height of the HIV epidemic in the country. Can I ask you about that and how that yes. affected you? So, so then I actually left uh, the ministry and I went to head a project um, of USAID uh, that was uh, focused on doing about four things. One was HIV prevention work. Um, Two was general reproductive health work, uh, so family planning and you know, uh, syndromic management of sexually transmitted infections, of course, um, of, of the HIV um, pandemic at that point. Then community-based healthcare financing schemes, um, and the third, uh, the fourth element was public-private partnerships. You know, trying to get the private sector to do more in delivery of health services. You know. Uh, so that's what the project was about. And uh, I, you know, I did that for some time, uh, for about two years. And then, uh, but I kept, still I kept running into economists all the time. And, and they, they were driving me nuts. I thought I'd fix the management side. Now they were, they were still coming up with their arguments about all these concepts that I didn't, I didn't understand well. So I decided, you know what, the solution is let me go study economics. So I went to University of Cape Town. Um, and I did a degree, a master's in health economics. Um, then, even before I graduated, my professor at that time took up a job at the UN as part of the task force that were developing the Millennium Development Goals. Um, so when she left, uh, she left a vacancy, you know, running a program called Oliver Tambo Fellowship Program. Who has ever flown through Johannesburg? You, you, when you are landing, you, the, the airport, you know, they call it Oliver Tambo. So Oliver Tambo was the first ANC president. Um, he should have been the, f the first democratically elected president of South Africa had he not died. Um, and so Mandela kind of benefited from his misfortune. Um, he's not as famously known as Mandela is, but really uh, he was the powerhouse and the, the force behind the ANC. So when when South Africa came out of apartheid, uh, what happened within the health sector was, you know, the previous managers in the health sector who are from the then apartheid government, they all left the health sector, the public health sector, in mass. Uh, so when they, they, so all of a sudden there was this vacuum on who would step in to manage things. So a whole new generation of of managers and leaders who are appointed from previously uh, disadvantaged demographic groups, so mostly blacks, uh, what they called coloreds at that time in South Africa, um, and a few Indians. So, but they had not managed things, you know. So you'd find, for example, nurses uh, who did nursing training uh, through the University of South Africa as a, a long distance program and then you are made the CEO of a hospital with a, a budget of $100 million and a staff of 1,000 and facilities and things. And you have no idea on what, what you need to do. So through a partnership between the South African Department of Health, which is a you know, Minister of Health, University of Cape Town, and the Kaiser Family Foundation 
here in the US, they came up with a program called Oliver Tambo Health Leadership Fellowship Program. And this was um, a structured 18 month program um, that had, that would admit, you know, practicing managers from the health sector. They would bring them uh, four times in a year, two weeks at a time to University of Cape Town and teach them about, you know, health leadership, health management, basics of health economics, policy making, all that stuff. Um, and then they would develop a project while they are studying to solve a specific problem they are facing in their workplace. We're in their jobs. They are in their jobs. There's no yeah. chance, there's no time at this point there was to no take people for, out of their no. jobs. So the, mo the most they would do is two weeks out of, uh, out of a quarter. So then they would, so they would go and, and they work through their projects. You know, they come back for another block, they get taught something else, like, you know, they teach them on how to do a uh, situation analysis. So all the courses at that, t at that point are focused on that. How do you do, you know, a situation analysis that is looking at all the different things. Then when you go back, you do that. Then next time you come and you say, okay, now we're gonna teach you about setting priorities, you know, and, and appraising different options for doing things then you go back and you do that. And so you keep learning things, you put them into practice. Meanwhile, you have mentors that are following you up in your workplace and they are, they are coaching you and they are mentoring you on how to do things. So, and then after 12 months, you, you go and finish up your project, you do an evaluation of the project, you come up with the results and you, you present them and if you're successful, plus all the different courseworks you've done, you get awarded a postgraduate diploma in health management. Um, so, so the professor who was running that program, but also was part of the School of Public Health, left. So before I graduated, so they asked me to, to apply to take her place. That's when it gets interesting. Um, <laughs> my dad, who had been a teacher, later on decided to do business and, and farming, had always cautioned us that if you want to get rich, don't become a teacher. <laughs> and the reason he, he, I think he was telling us that, he grew up and you know, as an adult, and uh, our famous president, who most of you probably know Uganda for, uh, who has watched The Last King of Scotland? The movie, Last, Last King of Scotland? The, Anybody has ever watched that movie? I have. I think you have? We're all, we're older, I think, than this crowd here. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. So there was this guy one time called Idamin, that became president of Uganda. You know, he staged a coup in 1971 and became president. He was, uh, you know, semi-illiterate. You know, and so when he took over, he basically anything to do with education he killed. So for that reason, you know, professionals didn't have a future in the country. So that was the reason why our dad felt like, you know, if you really want to get ahead in life, don't become a teacher. So all of a sudden, University of Cape Town asks me to apply for this senior lecture position. At the back of my mind, I was like, oh gosh, there it comes now. Poverty is coming <laughs> after me. After spending all this money studying all this time, all, now I have, to, uh, have to become a teacher. That anyone in this room is thinking about those? No, 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 no. Things right? are things are different. You know, I, I think uh, that's what my dad thought at that time. Um, so I applied for the job. Yeah. So this program was interesting in that, in addition to being part of the university program, because whoever leads it also has an academic appointment uh, within the university, and you have to do other university things. But half your time, you're running the fellowship program. But the Department of Health and Kaiser Family Foundation, obviously, had an interest in the quality of the program. So they set up a special board. So there was an Oliver Tambo Fellowship uh, Board. And the chair of the board was the, the wife of Oliver Tambo. Wow. Yeah, she was the, she was the chair of the board. And, and then you had folks from the Department of Health and University of Cape Town you know, individuals picked uh, from South Africa, private sector, public sector. And the Kaiser family was an observer, the uh, foundation was an observer on the board. So, so the university folks um, invited me for an interview with other candidates, but they said we have to put up a presentation on how we would improve the program. So what I decided was to get myself out of this competition, I was gonna be very critical about the program. 
So I was very critical about it. I talked about all the gaps, all the things they're not doing well, how the you know recruitments for candidates are going down. You're, they're no longer getting prestigious candidates. People prefer instead to go to London, to the London School for six months to do something similar or even worse. So I thought by doing that, I wouldn't get the job. So then they decided to offer me the job. Your strategy education didn't work out so well. It, it, it didn't work out. So, so I took up the job. And uh, um, so I was teaching health policy and planning on this other side of the university. And uh, I also was doing courses in pharmaceutical economics and macroeconomic uh, policy stuff. But I also was running this program and uh, mentoring these managers in their workplaces. Uh, so that's what I was doing uh, for three and a half years. And just to put this that time frame in a little context, the HIV epidemic in South Africa was... It was there. It was on fire at that it point. It was on fire at that time, and there was this president called Tabo Mbeki who had come up with his own theory about HIV and AIDS. Some of you who are old enough, you may remember. He was saying HIV doesn't cause AIDS, and, and, and that caused a lot of, uh, I don't know, there was a political uproar, you know. So all the academics were against him because they thought he was propagating this conspiracy theory that was, so people were coming up with all sorts, because he's a smart guy, I mean, he's an economist, uh, you know, well-trained, I think he went to, uh, to Cambridge. So, he's, you know, but nobody w could understand why he was pushing that theory. But at the same time, South Africa had decided they were going to start treating people uh, who are living with HIV. In fact, that started when President Mandela uh, was still president. But their drugs were very expensive. So the story you don't normally hear about, South Africa decided to produce their own generic antiretroviral drugs. You know, And guess what happened? The US government sued Mandela for that. Bill Clinton was president. So, so that's some time, it took some time for Bill Clinton to actually be, you know, be liked in, you know, there are so many horror stories around him in, in Africa that people didn't like him for because of some of those things that were happening. I mean, here, he, you know, they were suing the South African government for wanting to produce drugs for, for their own people. So yes, some things were happening, but I think a lot of the focus was on the controversy you know, of Tabo, uh, Tabo Mbeki, that people actually forgot about all the good work that was going on. But South Africa was the only country that was actually offering treatment uh, to its citizens who, had, who were infected with, uh, with HIV. Most of the other countries, even when I was doing a USAID project in Uganda, were focused on prevention. Because, because they, they had no access to well, There was no access to drugs. There were probably about, like, in Uganda, I could count maybe 100 or 50 or 200 people that you know, were importing drugs directly out of UK to treat themselves, those who could afford, because it was damn expensive. So yeah. And I just want to put that in kind because this is an incredibly difficult period from an epidemiological standpoint. But you, at that point, had you'd, you'd started to move into health management, broadly yes. stated. It seems like a passion. Yeah, so I was I was really focused on that stuff, and I even enrolled in a, in a PhD program um, uh, at at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, uh, so I, you know, I had a professor I was collaborating with at the University of Cape Town. He was from Karolinska. He went back, so I decided I should go get um, a PhD, f you know, from there. And I was looking at uh, different things altogether. I was looking at the impact of. Uh, um, pharmaceutical policy, you know, on health outcomes. And I was, I, was, I was looking at South Africa, Zambia, and Uganda. So I'd even gone through the first collection of data. And I was looking at some things. You know, one of the nested studies I did was um, looking at something called the drug lag. So when the US FDA registers drugs, you know, approves new drugs, um, or EMEA, the European Medicines, uh, uh, regulatory agency, you would assume that the day after those drugs, you're going to find them in all the other countries. So I started, you know, I, I started looking at the database of the FDA, and some drugs would take 20 years before you find them in, in poor countries, before they can get to the poor countries. Uh, and even when they get, because you can't afford the patented ones, 
So it takes forever to get off patent. And even when they do, a lot of pharmaceutical companies would go back in towards the end and they patent something in the process. So the actual drug is no longer on patent, but then the, one of the manufacturing steps is still patented, so you cannot go and you know and produce that as a generic. So that kind of you know was getting me all wild, you know, wild up. But I was still interested in market access issues at that point. Uh, HIV was there in the background, uh, and but I was looking at from purely an access issue as opposed to, uh, although I, I you know I had friends and colleagues and relatives who died from, from AIDS. I grew up in Uganda, as you know. Uh, some villages were wiped out. Those of you who do, who, who read papers, you hear something about Rakai all the time. Most of these studies, you know, in Rakai, that whole village was more or less wiped out. Um, but you got to a point where you kind of accepted that, you know, this thing was here to stay and whatever you can do, you'll just focus on prevention. Those who will survive will survive. Those who will die will die. So I wasn't looking to pursue a career in, in HIV-related work at all. I was more interested in healthcare financing, policy issues, and, and that's what I was and doing in South Africa. Medicines issues. Access to medicine, that's and the stuff. I was, I was even on the WHO uh, Medicines Pricing uh, Technical Committee. Those are the things I was interested in. Um, that's what I was doing. And then? Then what we'll, happens next? Then one day, I, I go home after work, and I get a phone call from the US. And somebody from, uh, from Baltimore, uh, Catholic Relief Services, calls me on the phone and says, uh, are you so-and-so? I said, yeah. I said, you know, we've come across your CV, um, and we'd like to talk to you about an opportunity we have. I'm like, OK, what is that? Uh, he said, we recently got funded by PEPFA, so I asked, what is PEPFA? I had no idea what PEPFA was. And the reason I didn't know about PEPFA is, you know, PEPFA came up around the same time that the US was invading Iraq. So in South Africa in particular, you know, especially the newspapers, the academicians, they were up in arms. You know, I remember we had a conference in San Francisco, uh, Health, International Health Economics Association conference. And all our senior colleagues refused to come to attend that conference in protest against the, the Iraq invasion, you know. So anything that was coming out of the US, however good it was, nobody cared. I remember there was some article about PEPFAR in the newspaper by a professor from Stellenbosch University, and he was arguing that the US is finding, is trying to find a way of accessing millions of people living with HIV in Africa and do research on them, take that data and go back. There's, there's no interest in helping improve outcomes whatsoever. So that was the perception at that, at that point. Uh, so when this person tells me about PEPFAR, I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and they said, you know, they, they thought I could, I could help do some things with them. Um, so they said they were going for a conference in Thailand on their way back in about two weeks' time. Would I care to meet them at, at Oliver Tambo Airport? one of those hotels and they tell me more about it. So that's what I did. I, f I flew up there from Cape Town and I met um, a lady from CRS, Catholic Relief Services. They have their offices in Baltimore. Um, and guess who? Uh, Dr. Robert Redfield from University of Maryland because they were partners in that program. He's now the director of the Centers now for the Disease Control. For CDC, you know, you know, um, so, okay, so they, they talked to me about it and they said, you know, we, they are going to work in 12 countries, uh, in Guyana, Haiti, and the rest were all Sub-Saharan African countries. And they wanted somebody who understood how the health system works in, in those countries, and they thought I could help them uh, to navigate the issues in the health system, uh, help them with supply chain issues for getting drugs into those countries, you know, lab equipment, point of care technology, all this stuff. Um, and I said, would I be interested in something like that? I wasn't looking for a job. I said, you know, I really don't know. So they said, okay, why don't we invite you to come to the U.S.? We'll be holding a one-week retreat, um, program planning retreat. Come listen to what we are talking about. Maybe you might pick interest. So I, I went. Um, I attended the meeting I, you know, in a conference room like this. I was at the back. Since I wasn't part of the team, I was mostly seated at the back as an observer, and I listened to them talk about 
different things. You know, they had some very good ideas, but some crazy ideas too. Uh, like one of the ideas was they were going to get a warehouse near uh, the Ravens Stadium in Baltimore, and they would buy all these drugs from all over the, the U.S. and they put them in the warehouse. The same with lab reagents, and they start shipping them all over the world uh, to all these different countries. I'm like, oh wow, that really sounds fancy. Good luck if you get those drugs into any of the countries. They said, what do you mean? I said, you have to understand something about regulations, you know. To get into Rwanda, they are going to want all their drugs labeled in French. You know, I don't think American companies produce drugs in the U.S. and label them in French. Kenya might want a shelf life, which is the expiry date, uh, of about 80% left before the drugs enter the country. Uganda wants 75%. Um, you know, Zambia may want 90%. So how are you going to harmonize and reconcile all that if you're buying things from the same batch and putting them uh, in the same warehouse. How are you going to sort them out? Um, then I said, you also have to think about whether these drugs are, are registered. You know, And I told them there is something about the pharmaceutical industry that you may not know about. They segment the markets. So the American market doesn't serve Africa. If you want to get into the African pharmaceutical market, you have to do it from Europe. The headquarters is in Brussels. Um, and that's, those are the people you have to talk to for them to sell your drugs. Yeah, the American companies will never send drugs to that market because they're interfering uh, with their colleagues in Europe. So I said that won't work. Now, they didn't believe me. Okay. So your friend, Bob, yes. uh, <laughs> during, during the break, he picked up a phone and called the vice president of GSK. Because he knew him, you know, when you're a medical doctor in the U.S., before they stopped uh, doctors from interacting with uh, with pharma a lot, um, they you know they know each other. He called him and asked whether they could help get them one of the drugs, Combivir, you know, um, into into some countries in Africa. And the guy was like, "No, I can't do that, but I can give you a number of my counterpart in Brussels," <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it turns out you were. I was right. But it gets better. Okay. Yeah. So they had launched a program. Um, Mark Daibo, my colleague now at the center, you know, was in PEPFA. So when they started the program, the first one of the first sites that enrolled people through PEPFA was in Uganda. So they were all there. They were excited about it. Um, so they they rushed to get people onto drugs. The dip, the problem with uh, ARVs, as you know. Unlike, say, malaria treatment, a lot of the supply systems that had been developed in, in many countries were for acute practice. It's to you know supply drugs to treat malaria. Whereas you have got contraception that was there, supported mostly by USAID, but it's a, you know it's a, a small segment of the population anyway uh, that is affected by that. So when you come in with ARVs, you need to have a sustained supply chain. So if you enroll somebody in treatment today, you have to think about their treatment requirements one month down the road, two months, three months. So the forecasting systems didn't work like that. So when they gave people, you know, say doses for 2,000 patients, the providers just enrolled 2,000 patients on those doses, and then everything ran out. You know, you don't have doses, you know, enough medicine for the next month. And so what are you going to do? You know, because Pharmaceutical companies at that time were only producing for about, if I recall, about 15,000 patients all over Africa, including South Africa, 15,000. All of a sudden, within one month, you know, you had like 50,000 patients. And, and how many do we have today? Oh, millions. Now it's like 9 million um, yeah. people on treatment in Africa alone. Um, so the supply chain systems were not, you know, primed for this. So for this program of University of Maryland and CRS, there were in 12 countries, they also ran into the same problem. So they tried calling all the vice presidents they knew all over the world to get drugs they could not. So <laughs> it turns out there was a small United Nations initiative that was experimenting about ARV access in certain countries. It was a partnership between UNAIDS and the leading pharma companies. Um, and Uganda was one of the countries where they had 
an office. So a classmate of mine was running that initiative. You know, I had left Uganda, you know, but I knew he was running it. But he was stuck with, you know, with the drugs. They had the drugs, but then they couldn't sell them because the people couldn't afford them. Uh, so I picked up a phone from the US and I woke him up in the middle of the night and I said, do you, do you have drugs that you could deliver to a place by tomorrow morning? Don't worry about the payment, we will sort it out. And indeed, the following day, he, he went to the warehouse because he had the drugs that couldn't sell, and he delivered them uh, to a medical store run by Catholics and Protestants in Uganda that was supporting um, that CRS program. And then for Kenya, um, when I was still engaged in the pharmaceutical industry, I had colleagues uh, who were working for GSK, and you know, so some of them had risen. One of them was a regional manager now uh, for Eastern and Southern African market based in Nairobi. Uh, so I also woke him up in the middle of the night. He had totally forgotten about me. Uh, so when I introduced myself, it was like, do you still remember me? I was like, who are you calling me at 1 a.m.? You know, what are you looking for? So I told him, you know, I, I for insisted, antiretroviral insisted, drugs. Insisted. He got up and then I said, I'm looking for, for assistance. He's like, you don't talk to me for more than 10 years. And now you call me in the middle of the night. And all you want is, is help from me. So anyway, uh, we sorted things out. He also gave me the drugs. So by the following day, when we went back to this meeting, I told them that I'd solved their problem. All they needed to do um, is make sure that they pay for those drugs that have been delivered to their warehouses in Kenya and Uganda. That's how you got your so next at job. At that point, <laughs> exactly. they said, I could not go. I have to join them. So how many years did you spend with that team? I, I, I was at CRS for only one year and a half. But because I was mostly working with the University of Maryland, and the University of Maryland was the, what they called the technical partner. They were, they were together. With they CRS. were together in the same consortium. And, and uh, to give credit, Dr. Redfield really is the one who went after the, the award. But um, he knew the university, a state university at that, could not go function you know, in foreign countries easily. So he went to CRS, which is a relief development organization that has offices all over the world, and said, you know, you become the prime. We will write the proposal, give it to you, submit it, um, and indeed they got funded. We will do all the work. All you have to do is focus on moving the money from the US um, overseas. And that's how it was. But then, as I kept traveling with, with Bob and his team, I realized they didn't understand how the health system works. And for those of you who want to do global health, at the end of the day, when you ask whatever question you ask me, one of the answers I'm going to give you is this simple one. You really have to understand how a health system works. Find one health system, and then you can use that to quickly learn about the others. If you don't know how a health system works, it's very difficult for you to succeed in global health. And, and I quickly learned with my colleagues, and over the years, that the, the US healthcare system is so complex that the main actors within that system don't really know how it works. You know, I, I, so when I did my doctorate here, I decided that's what I was gonna focus on, actually, to learn. Oh, yeah, I was like, you know, why should I go do something in global when I'm spending all this money to acquire an education, I should learn something new. So I focused on things like Medicare, Obamacare, and stuff like that, just to get an idea on how things work. So the reason I'm giving this example was, you know, one of my colleagues, I didn't even know about it, we were going on a trip together, and he, he had gotten donations from, uh, from Gilead for the drug called Travada, because uh, we have lots of patients in, in Baltimore living with HIV. So, you know, they put it in, in suitcases and we went to Kenya. So we went, we trained providers, we went to health facilities, we talked about things. I, unbeknown to me, I didn't know that they had actually carried Travada and there was this missionary doctor at one of the mission hospitals. They gave him the drugs. I was an American missionary. So, what he decided to do, you know, he knew everything about this drug being a superior regimen, so he put some patients on that drug. Now, Kenya as a country had not approved that drug yet. It wasn't on the treatment guidelines. It wasn't even registered. So fast forward, a month later, they have a national meeting of people who are delivering HIV care, and one of the doctors from the mission facility asks a question 
about a patient who has developed side effects to this drug called Travada. And everything in the room, I was in that meeting, everything in the, you, know, you could see the light bulbs go off. How did you get Travada in this country to start putting patients on? He said, oh, he said, University of Maryland folks brought it for me and we, we actually have 300 patients on, on that drug. Wow. How did that go over? Oh, it didn't go well. <laughs> The interesting thing, do you know who was running the government of Kenya program at that time? Oh, Dr. Sylvia Ojo. Another one of our colleagues here at Georgetown. Yes. The, who, so. That's how we became friends in trying to sort out this problem. Th that mean, you had created. In the end, you know, I convinced her, I said, you better join us <laughs> in order to stop people from, stop these Americans from making these types of mistakes. You know, we need someone like you who knows how things work to guide us. So she became our our country director. So because of that experience, um, I, I told Dr. Redfield that you guys mean very well, but you have very little understanding of the health system. And CRS, who is your main partner, is a relief organization. They also don't know what a health system means. Whatever they've done in the health space has been very much at a community level. HIV care requires mainstream Minister of Health. You have to know how that sector works. So. I'm going to join University of Maryland, and I actually help you set up a program that can work by passing CRS, because you're wasting your time. CRS doesn't know how to do this. And they're never going to develop the medical capacity to do this. It's so it's, mission, it's no. not their mission. So it's easy for me to join a group like yours, and I teach you how to do global health you know, in the right way. And that's how the partnership with Dr. Redfield started. You work with Dr. Redfield for how many years? 12 years. And then we had the good fortune. Well, you're doing I don't know about the good fortune, but we are. We had the good fortune. I don't know if it was a good fortune. I don't for know. You. A, uh, for I me. Don't, I, for, I don't know, but yeah. But you, were, you did this amazing work for 12 years with Dr. Redfield, of helping to manage and support health care programs throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Parts of Africa. And then you came here to join us uh, last year, along with Dr. Sylvia Oju and and Dr. Bola Gobir um, and other colleagues that were at the University of Maryland. So maybe you, you just to close a little bit about what you're doing here at Georgetown um, with the new program, the Center for Global Health Practice and Impact. I know you've you've been thinking a lot about how to make programs work better, particularly how to reach populations that were not or traditional or conventional programs. Just a little bit about your work now, and then we can open it up for larger questions. But I'd love to get your take on So someone like me who, who comes from a country that benefits a lot from global health initiatives, um, you, you see things differently. Because what others call global health, for us it's basic health care. You know, so if you go and you're talking to a Kenyan or a Ugandan or a South African working in their country and you're talking about global health, you know, global health to us refers to those issues that cross borders. So coronavirus is a global health issue, for, you know, but HIV care is not a global health issue because it's something that we have to do within our healthcare system. Um, so in some ways, you have to figure out a way of building effective partnerships with people who, are, who want to do global health and are helping you, you know, your country um, to meet its population health needs um, and kind of meet them halfway. You, kind of, you, don't, you don't want to push them away because there is a lot of development assistance money that goes into health, which we need uh, in a lot of these countries. But at the same time, you also want that money does not drive how healthcare is delivered in the countries because it could help distort uh, the healthcare system, you know, and cause impact that you are not thinking about, that you didn't intend it to. One of the things, for example, that I think HIV uh, money has done that we have to contend with over time, because of the magnitude of the problem and a lot of the money that, ha that comes behind that issue we've kind of created a separate healthcare system that is focused on providing HIV care. And if you look at the cost structure of, of that system, 
no country can afford it. You know, a lot of the countries can't afford that. So then the question becomes, um, how do you take those good gains, you know, and sustain them in an environment where financial sustainability, you know, is out of the question because you cannot afford, you know, to put in the same type of resources that, say, PEPFA or the Global Fund puts in. Um, so, so people like me, I think where we can make a contribution and our center is trying to do that, is to explore those intersections between global health and, and what it would take to sustain those interventions uh, within the context of those countries. And so what we are trying to work on um, is partner with governments to identify more cost-effective interventions uh, and ways of leveraging what has been done in the HIV space, spread it across the entire healthcare system as a way of sustaining it. I'll give you an example. Um, if you go into a health facility and you're looking for HIV care, you're HIV infected, chances are your patient records are going to be electronic. You know, very, very efficient electronic health record systems in some of the poorest and least resourced facilities, you know, on, 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 on the surface of the earth. But if you come into the same facility, you know, with a malaria infection, your records are gonna be paper-based. So what we're now saying is a lot of the countries uh, driven by WHO, but also the realization that health um, is, a, is, is more than just a benefit, it's more of a human rights issue. How do we increase access you know, to good healthcare for everyone, regardless of the economic means and circumstances? Now, to do that, you need a backbone of a functioning healthcare system, most especially primary care. But a lot of these countries do not have the resources to build an efficient primary care system that can support universal you know, uh, health coverage goals. So what, what we are saying is, you could look at what HIV has done and you take those interventions and those systems developed for HIV because it's, a, it's, a, it's a, if an effective HIV primary care system. You could take that with a little bit of additional investment you know, from your government as a country or from some other partner of yours like Gates Foundation or even the World Bank. You take those systems and you spread them across the entire healthcare system because the backbone is already developed. You know, PEPFAR has already brought internet into the hospital. You already have the computers. You've got data clerks already trained. Healthcare workers are trained on how to use uh, EHRs. So all you have to do is take this to the entire hospital. So, and, and when you look at the incremental cost, it is not that much, you know? So we are beginning to work with, uh, with different governments to explore those, uh, those types of approaches. But, uh, but at the same time, we're also moving away from, HIV has created a whole industry of activists. And I, you know, I'm all for activism, I support activism, but not all of us have to be activists. Uh, so you have what we call civil society in many places, but civil society really, it's an advocacy voice, you're agitating for certain things. That's not necessarily representative of all the population, you know? So for us, what we're looking at is how do we get community voice, individual community voices, into design of interventions, into the health policy making process, into resource allocation decisions in, in the governments. So we are, we are working uh, at the lowest level of communities, working with people who normally don't, don't get to the table, are not really part of the civil society leadership, uh, to get them to engage and help, you know, design um, their future, so to speak. So we are working with um, experts in human-centered design to get, like, the youth to engage in designing uh, family planning programs. Because, you know, the traditional ones don't work for them. We are still putting up, you know, in some countries, they're still doing radio announcements and some TV commercials and, and big billboards if you travel in many of these places, the youth don't, they don't consume information like that anymore. So for them, they wanna use social media, they wanna, you know, and if you, you say you're creating um, youth-friendly services in the corners of the hospital, 
But then you put in um, a 60-year-old provider to provide those services. Who, this is their grandmother or their grandfather or their father or their mother. They're not going to go there. So we are looking at how do you want a service designed that works for you, meets your needs. And then we're bringing politicians and policymakers around the same table to engage with the youth in designing those things so that we move away from coming up with solutions for the people all the time and we let the people actually solve their own problems. And when you do that, we're beginning to see evidence they actually can do it and do it very cost effectively. So those are some of the things we are working on, but we also still engaged in trying to end the AIDS epidemic and, and looking at other uh, diseases of global concern because those are still killers and we have to deal with that, but we have an eye uh, on long-term sustainability in whatever we do. Dave, do you have anything? Should we open it up? Open it up. But as I told you, this would be a story different from the ones that we've heard so far, and what an amazing one. So let me start. So I think what we'll do is, as we do every uh, evening, is start with the students who prepared emails. So I think that's who's, who's on the list. Okay, so Cameron, you want to start? Hi, I'm Cameron, and thank you again for coming. My question is about your paper that you provided called Leveraging the Private Health Sector to Enhance HIV Services in Lower Income Countries. And I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was interesting to hear about how the private health sector can be engaged. But I noticed that most of the paper is focusing on empl employing the private health sector in cities. So I was wondering if the same approach can be used in rural areas. And if not, should the public health sector be enhanced in rural areas to make up for that difference? Very interesting question. I, I don't even remember when, when we wrote that. but. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it actually came out of a presentation I, I gave at IAS in Vienna, um, I think 2010, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So there are different views about the private sector's role in health. There are, there are folks who think that, who believe that the private sector shouldn't be involved in health at all because of the profit motive. You know, that is private for profit. There's also private not for profit, but mostly the concern is private for profit. Then there are also those who believe that the private sector could help increase access to care. And there are so many schemes out there um, for getting you know, the private sector to provide services to the poor. I personally have a problem with that, and this is the reason why. If you've got 50% of the population or 30% of the population of a country living on less than a dollar a day, and you're telling them to go pay for their health care, one way or the other, it doesn't matter what price they're paying it at. I don't think that promotes equity. I think to me that is, that is a more aggressive way of financing health care by targeting the poor to go use the private sector. And there are so many programs that have been designed that way. What I personally believe in is we probably should be channeling people who have money, the middle income folks and the upper income folks in the countries, maybe to use more of the private sector, if, you know, if the private sector is involved in their countries, and free up public resources for the poor. Unfortunately, what happens is in most cities where you have some of the teaching hospitals and you have some of the best consultants and doctors, guess what happens? It is people with means who go to those you know, facilities to consult those consultants and, you know, and experts for free, paid by the taxpayer. And then the poor person, what happens to them? They go to the drug shops, uh, they go to the doctor or the nurse with the clinic around the corner uh, to pay for their health care. And unfortunately, they don't get good quality care. You know, what they do, because they don't have a lot of money, even with the prescription, they don't buy the entire prescription they get like for one day or for two days because that's what they can, they can afford. So, so now the African Union, for example, um, and we're working with them on this, uh, they are looking at the private sector in a different way. Uh, they are pushing for an increased private sector role, but in things that the governments don't do. And we want the private sector to actually bring money and invest in infrastructure in the health system. Um, and help relieve the pressure that is on the public system 
so the public system can actually take care of the people that can't afford to do that. Because at the moment, what happens with most private sector, they see, they see themselves as just supplying goods and services to the government. So they participate in tender and procurement tenders, and they get paid by government to supply goods. But they are not out there building hospitals. They're not out there building city scan centers. So the role I would like to see personally that I believe in is that the private sector should come in and provide healthy competition to the public sector, but it should be well regulated. Um, but initially, it should really target those that have the means to pay for their own health care as a way of in, you know, opening access to those who can't afford. And that means the rural areas, honestly, I think that's maybe where the government should be providing services. If governments don't want to go there and there is a private provider who wants to go to the rural area, the government should pay you know, such a provider to go set up services and provide uh, and provide them to the rural poor that can't afford. That that's really that's my my thinking on this issue. But there are many others that would disagree with me, who believe in some, you know, cost-effective community-based health insurance schemes that they should be used to pay for private services. Um, I, for one, I, I I don't think that's the solution. Thank you. Um, oh, he was on. Um, my question kind of built off Cameron's. Um, it's about the same article. And last week we had a conversation about the um, about universal health coverage and its likelihood and what we also talked about private public partnerships and how important they are for universal health coverage to become a realistic possibility. And in the same article Cameron referenced, um, it suggests that without enabling policy, market incentives, and regulations, universal health care is a unre pretty unrealistic goal. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to like, how the US is doing in terms of reaching those goals, or if um, there's been any improvement that you've seen that's kind of moving us towards meeting those criteria for promoting public-private partnerships for universal health care. In the US, or you are? You're asking in general. I, I don't think I'm an expert on the US healthcare system. Um, I probably stay away from that and just speak broadly to that issue. Um, so there are a lot of good things going on um, around the world, and I think a, a lot of experts and citizens are working towards achieving the goals of universal health coverage, which to me really is building off what we all agreed to do back in the days. You remember the Alma, Alma Atta declaration? That was primary, primary care 311, really. We're just getting back to it. Now, what I'm seeing happening in different countries, uh, you have a country like Rwanda, for example, that has actually done this. You know, people don't often talk about it, but 97% uh, of Rwandans have access to healthcare, uh, either paid for by government, for those who can't afford, and for those who can afford, pay for it. But they're all part of some health insurance scheme uh, that the government supports. Then you have a country like Kenya that is moving very fast towards that. And what I've seen uh, in that country that I, um, I get worried about, it's being pushed mostly by the private sector who are thinking in terms of what this means for business. So th the country is mostly focused on organizing the healthcare financing side of the equation but they're not really thinking so much about the delivery side. Because at the end of the day, you can have all the money you, you want, but if you don't have a delivery system, people still won't have access. Then there's also the question of quality of the care that people are paying for. I, th I, I think in most uh, developing countries, they, we always, in one way or another, people really would want to pay for healthcare, even out of their own pockets. Uh, the challenge is that we don't pay for value. And wh what do I mean by this? We don't pay for value for a variety of reasons. The private sector is not well regulated. So when you look at quality standards, they would vary from place to place. Uh, for the most part, the private sector is supposed to regulate, self-regulate. You know how that goes. Um, all you have to do in many of the countries is you get a license to operate as a provider. So, but it's all about paying the fees. And then you put up your license and that's it. You know, 
the professionals, like the medical profession that is supposed to regulate how doctors practice medicine, by and large, they don't because they are all the same colleagues, so they don't want to report each other. Peer review uh, is, a big, is a big issue in healthcare. Nobody likes peer review. Even here in the US, that's why doctors here hate meaningful use, meaningful use, you know, because then that exposes them to, to how they're practicing uh, medicine. Um, so I think what we referred to in that paper is generally what happens within the health sector, the market failure issues that are very, very common in, in health because you've got the supplier who always knows more than the consumer. The assumption is that this supplier, you know, has the best interest of the consumer at heart, that therefore they're gonna do the right things. So you tell me, if you are a doctor who is also dispensing drugs, and I used to see this when I was still practicing pharmacy, uh, you know, in private pharmacies, you could see if somebody parked a Mercedes Benz outside the pharmacy and walks in with a script, if there are two drugs, one is generic and the other one is one of the, you know, patented ones, um, or the branded ones from the original manufacturer, you would see that the staff are pushing to sell the branded product because it's going to be like 10 times the price compared to you know, the generic one. So if you do not have a system that, that for example, has approved pharmacy lists, you know, which I think is one of the problems we have in this country, because in many other developed countries, you, know, you have all these uh, approved formularies of what you can, you know, you can prescribe. If a patient wants something that is off the, you know, off the formula, and most of them are generic in nature, then you do the copay. You pay for that additional premium if you want a branded product. So, so I think we have first to work on the regulatory framework, alongside as we work on the healthcare financing issues, as we work on improving the delivery system. We also have to focus on putting in place a robust regulatory framework. Otherwise, we're going to end up with what the economists call uh, regulatory capture, whereby the people who are supposed to be regulated end up <laughs> taking over the regulatory regime. And when that happens, essentially their interests uh, take precedence over the people's interests. So, so I, I'm a firm believer in the private sector doing, getting involved in health. And I think we can't, we can't do it without them you have to regulate. Because at the end of the day, profit motive, it's still there. You can't take that one away. Um, I guess this is a good segue into what I was hoping to ask. Um, since we're talking about quality of care and regulation of private sector, I was wondering if you could maybe talk about how a country can effectively regulate the private sector when delivering these health services, and also, I guess, on a more foundational a broader scale, do you think there are like international standards that should be followed for the delivery of health services or should we like focus on building up from local governments to national governments and then on an international, like having an international framework? So we, we thank you, that's a very, you know, that's a very brilliant question. We always say that, you know, y you go with global best practices, but you, everything is local. You still have to contextualize some of those things. Uh, so there are these international standards that many countries um, are beginning to pick up. Um, ISO, quite, you know, certifications, there are accreditation schemes that are happening. Um, there are some hospitals I see uh, on the continent at the moment that even have US uh, accreditation on the lab side. We have a robust um, accreditation program for labs, um, uh, you know, called Slimta and Slipta, and it's actually run out of the African Union uh, for the African countries. Um, in places like South Africa, you have uh, an organization called COSASA, which is about accrediting health facilities. Um, uh, so what, what, what is happening at the moment in many of these developing countries is we are starting with the hardware. So we are starting with, you know, let's at least ensure that the, health, the hospital meets the physical standards for being a hospital. You know, how are they, the hallways for, you know, wheeling patients through? And when the ambulance comes uh, and parks in front of the hospital, some of those hospitals had like staircases. So how are you gonna move a stretcher up a staircase in order to take a patient in. So, so hospitals are now beginning to fix those, those simple things, you know, 
uh, fire extinguishers. You would go into places and there are no fire extinguishers. You know, there are no disposable cans for medical waste. Um, you know, so those are the things now that have been have been worked on. And then in places like the lab, you have good lab um, practices that are getting institutionalized and standards. There are standard operating procedures. They are updated regularly. Um, and even this afternoon, we are you know we, we are discussing within our center. We are we are pursuing um, uh, an opportunity to funded by HHS to actually focus on on institutionalizing continuous quality improvement in several countries. Um, so what we're beginning to see now is countries are developing frameworks, uh, which are these good policies um, around quality and patient safety. Uh, a few hospitals have started putting those into practice. Uh, we, we see in some places what they call continuous quality improvement committees that are well structured, that are functional, that are working on improving the quality, solving specific problems, documenting that, measuring the impact that is having, and then uh, institutionalizing those practices now as best practices, and even spreading them beyond their own, the borders or the walls of their hospital uh, to other places through collaborative improvement um, learning networks. And we're beginning to see some experts that are working you know, to impart the basics of science of improvement Meanwhile, we're also looking at now getting accreditation happen uh, for providers. So what happens in some countries is you get your initial license. All you have to do every year, you keep paying membership fees. But really, nobody is assessing to see whether you still possess the, the qualities and the competencies to practice you know, your trade. So now you're beginning to see continuous medical education and professional development programs feeding into license renewal. So we, you know, and then at the policy level, yes, you also have um, um, new regulations coming up. The challenge is still around enforcement because good policies come up, good regulations are put in place, but then there are no resources put behind the enforcement side. Uh, of those organizations. So once we get to the enforcement, I, I think we'll get better. Um, there are improvements when it comes to drug, you know, um, importations or drug production, they're getting better with that uh, because at least people who are getting regulated are also financing the regulation. And that's why you, it kind of becomes a little bit tricky because uh, like, you know, one of the things I used to do at one time as a consultant, if a Chinese company or an Indian company wanted to go register their drugs in Kenya, what they would do, they would look for international consultants. You go to China or to India, you spend weeks there working in their, in their industry, in their factory, you know, helping them put in place good manufacturing practices. So that, you know, documenting, writing all these SOPs. The problem with that approach is that okay, the inspectors from WHO and the country regulatory agencies come, they spend a week, they, they go through all the manufacturing processes they certify that these guys are doing a fantastic job. You can register their product. The problem with that approach is once the, the mercenary consultants are gone and the inspectors are gone, the, the factory might go back to its you know, traditional practices. So the next batch of drugs you get in the country may not necessarily be the same quality as the one that was used as a sample to seek registration. So the question is, how do you build um, systems in your own country to continuously keep assessing the quality of those products that are coming into your country, as opposed to just one of, you know, certifications that give you registration, and then after that, you can bring whatever you want. Uh, so, but, uh, but, but uh, you know, there are some improvements we are saying. It's going to take a bit of time, and I think maybe that's the part where we need to get more support uh, from the international community, you know. We're not getting as much support when it comes to improving the regulatory capacity of countries as we, as we should. Hi. Um, Hi, sorry. I'm Ivana. I'm from Bolivia. Uh, we are here for the McDonald School of uh, Business uh, in a global competitiveness leadership program. 
uh, for two months. So uh, I was really identified with your history because um, actually I am an economist. <laughs> and uh, well, in the other way, I uh, had to study gerontology to reach my objectives as in the private sector to um, give access to the old, older people um, to a daycare center that the, these services uh, doesn't exist, uh, almost does, doesn't exist in Bolivia. So uh, we're trying to uh, generate this uh, access to for them in my country. Um, so I think I agree with you about uh, giving the private uh, special uh, up impact in the health systems in our developing countries. Uh, also, I want to ask you, what do you think about uh, these conditional cash transfers, which are uh, like an important policy to reach equality, uh, in also in health, because we have uh, in Bolivia a program that is focused on um, improve health for uh, mothers during the, the pregnancy um, through these conditional cash transfers. Uh, that's my question, and thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, when you go back to Bolivia, I, I think uh, you should put into practice whatever you learn in the business school here to, to, you know, to, to set up a vibrant uh, private sector enterprise. Um, we can talk more about that, why I think uh, we need business training for medical practitioners actually in order to, you know, to do viable businesses, which is good for all of us. Conditional grant transfers, uh, do you guys know anything about that? Okay, so some programs, because um, you're, you're trying to increase access uh, to certain services. For example, you want mothers to give birth in hospitals, because when they do that, you know, evidence is, is, is there that shows it's going to have an impact on their, on their infant outcomes, you know, even on the maternal outcomes, because a lot of mothers die while giving birth somewhere in some, in some small house in the village, and you don't have um, trained practitioners to attend to the birth delivery. So if you could put an incentive in place to encourage, you know, mothers to come and seek continental care, you know, and then stay through and give birth, in, you know, in a, in a facility, bring their children for immunization, and keep coming back, you know. Till at least uh, you get to a point where infant mortality is reduced significantly, or at least the risks have been taken care of, but also for the mother, it's a good thing. And I think you, there is evidence that shows it increases uptake of services. Now, the question I have uh, for those types of incentives is how do we sustain them? What happens when we withdraw the conditional whatever cash transfer? If we don't offer it to you next time you want to give birth and it's not there, will you have taken up this practice and now you understand the importance of, of seeking care within a health facility, therefore you can keep coming back even without, uh, without being given any, any kind of incentive? And we're seeing this also with HIV patients, for example. There are HIV patients um, that don't adhere well sometimes. And therefore, uh, you know, they're given either things like food, transport to come to the health facility, you know. And when you do that, you actually see immediate improvement. You know, people show up for the appointment. So then the question becomes, how do we, now we know what stops people from coming to seek services. So how are we gonna solve this in the long term? without having to keep injecting in more money to kind of like basically pay off people to come and seek healthcare. Uh, and I think there's still, we're still finding ways of sustaining things like those. Uh, so I support them, but I think they're useful to solve an immediate problem while we figure out a solution. And one of the things we are working on through this human-centered design approach of ours, it's for things like those. Ask the very people who are benefiting from these programs, what would it take for you to actually engage successfully in a healthcare system? You know, how would you like health services delivered that would work for you in your circumstance that would make it easy for you to actually want to engage? Uh, so through that type of discussions, 
we might come up with ideas that are more sustainable. Somebody might say, you know what, like we've seen for HIV services, at times people say, I come and I wait in, the, in a waiting room for three hours before they, they see me, and when they see me, they just want to draw blood. And that's it, they want to draw blood and go test my blood for viral load. And they tell me to come back in two weeks time for my results. But I spent three hours, yet I could have gone directly to the lab and they draw my sample and I walk out and everything takes less than 20 minutes. So what do we do in that case? Instead of paying this person to come and give their blood sample and wait for three hours, maybe work on an appointment system, you know? Work on an appointment system so that when they come into the facility, they don't have to wait for too long. And for those that have shown they can adhere to their treatment, you know, treatment is not rocket science. Why don't we just take it closer to where they live? You know, let's, let's allow situations where we can give people drugs for several months as opposed to having them come in every month for their treatment. You know, so you have to start thinking about redesigning the healthcare system to meet the needs of the people, but it should be redesigned with the people involved. When we say we reform, we transform, we, we redesign, normally it means that the professionals sit in some room, um, do market research or go out and do a focus group discussion, ask people, hey, you know, how can we do this? What, do you think this would work? Obviously, when you put people in a room like this and you ask them a question, they'll give you all sorts of answers. And then you go and you say, okay, I talk to the people, I know what they want, I'm gonna come up with a solution, and here is the solution. And in the end, you know, you build a hospital that nobody goes to. So we have to really, when we say human-centered design, we have to mean it. And we have to be prepared to hear the people say that the stuff you want to do for us sucks. It doesn't work for us. You know, forget about it, start afresh. Be open to that, and I, I can tell you a lot of prof professionals don't like that, you know? They, they say, but what does a patient know? What do you mean, what does a patient know? You know, <laughs> patients know what is wrong with them. Patients know what they need. You know, you just have to ask them. In fact, they would solve all the problems if you listen to the patients, you know? So that's how, that's how um, I would deal with this issue, but those are some of my concerns I have over it. Do you give additional credits for somebody who asks more questions? Yeah, yeah I do. Oh, she <laughs> exactly. So okay. she's gonna, she gets stuff. Oh, okay. Okay. She has the good question to ask. Should we? Um, this is a little unconventional and not really. Okay. Um, it's more about, like, you've had lots of years in school mm -hmm. um, with like an MBA, a PhD, and as like undergraduates, I'm sure a lot of us are contemplating like higher education or like real world experience. I was just wondering if you like, um, in all the different areas you've had school in, like if there was something common that you learned through all of them that has been consistent throughout all and like how that also compares to like your real world experience and working like in the field. And like, I guess that relates back to like asking patients for what they want and like their input versus academics who think that they know more than patients. Have you, have you ever heard of something called emotional intelligence? Yeah, there's a very nice paper out of, you know, in the Harvard Business Review, you know, about that. Um, one of my biggest takeaways in everything that I have done and all the experiences I've gone through is really have the confidence to know what I know and also what I don't know and not be shy about it. So in everything that I've done, whether it's in the workplace, but also through my schooling, that's the one lesson that I've, you know, I've kind of embraced and, and, uh, and, and seriously gotten into and buy into. Um, so even as I worked to better myself, one was to try to bridge the gaps of you know, my own weaknesses, where I felt I lacked things. But secondly, I also um, accepted that there are some things I will never be good at and it's okay. So what school taught me was to be able to find the resources or, the, or others uh, who possess what I don't possess and build the necessary bridges and partnerships, you know, in order to get things done. 
yeah, and and whether it was in the pharmacy school or whether you know when you're doing the lab project, you, you know you quickly realize that maybe as one person you may not be able to do this alone. That's why they we always encourage students to work in groups. It's to help you discover within that group setting what are you good at and what is someone else good at. That kind of helps later on in life, even even in the workplace, um, to learn how to work within teams. So for me, but also. The other lesson was you know, experience. There, there are certain things that you can be taught. There are certain things you just can't be taught. You have to live those experiences. And and my colleagues uh, from Bolivia, one of the things they will tell you is, you know, if you go to Bolivia, there are certain things that you might take months or years trying to learn about that you could ask somebody on the street and they just tell you in a second what it is. You just have to to have the strength and the courage to admit that you actually don't know things like that and you know and therefore you should uh, you should listen to those that know. And I will tell you as you plan to do global health, that's one of the things that drives people nuts in the countries. Um, when a fresh graduate shows up at the Ministry of Health in, in a country X and and is talking to all these you know, policy makers and providers, people with hundreds of, you know, years of experience combined, and somebody's trying to, to take them on based on what they read or learn uh, in class, and maybe two months in the country, you know, without really knowing um, how things work in that setting. Like even now, I've been, I've been reading a, a lot of uh, articles about this coronavirus thing in China and criticizing the, the director general of WHO, he should be resigning because he's not taking on China in a very serious way. You, you can clearly see that they are speaking from, uh, it's like, you know, when you are a, a coach, an armchair general coach, you know, like you tell others how to fight, you know, how to score, but you really don't know how to do it. You know, <laughs> it's only when you are there on ground zero, you realize and understand what it takes. That what might be straightforward black and white to you it's a lot of gray in the other places. Even when you think this is obvious, that why can't people realize this? There are so many other forces at play that people have to juggle and deal with, even for simple things. So even as you go through um, your learning journey, first of all, never stop learning. You don't need a degree to learn, so keep learning, but put as much uh, importance to experiential learning, what you learn through the informal networks, outside of the classroom as you would uh, in school. What, what school teaches you is the skills you can take and then apply in the real world. And you see how you can you know, quickly understand context and you know, engage uh, in different cultures and systems. But a lot of the stuff you've learned in class, you quickly realize when you get into the real world that they were just, that's the beginning of the learning. You know, you are now going to learn in a whole different way. Um, and I hope some of you will find yourselves deeply embedded in, in countries, in villages, and in big cities too, uh, trying to make big things happen. But don't rush. You just take your time. Eventually, you'll catch up. But if you want to work in global health, I go back to my first advice I gave even before you asked me have some understanding of how a health system works. When you know that, then you can easily see where you can come in. You know, because what you consider global <laughs> is local for people, and that's how. And those are the people you're going to work with. You know, um, so you need uh, you need to go in uh, knowing that, and, and be humble that you're actually going to learn more than you're taking, and then take those experiences to another place. Uh, and see how you can add value. That seems to me like a perfect way to 